Pixel is the phone by Google. It's just entered its fourth generation, and in that time we've seen triumph and disappointment in varying measures, ultimately leading in 2019 to two of the most brilliantly flawed handsets ever to come out of Mountain View. So how did we get here? This is the story of the Pixel, how Google as a brand got into making phones in the first place, and how the past three years of Pixels has given us notable successes and blunders that leaves many of us wondering just where the Pixel series goes from here. If we're going to start at the beginning, we need to go back further than the original 2016 Pixels. And you could argue that Google's first party smartphone journey began with Nexus way back in 2010. The Nexus One, built in collaboration with HTC, was the first in a series of many Nexus phones, tablets, and eventually uh, orbs that saw Google teaming up with a chosen manufacturer partner and dropping a new device each fall along with a fresh version of Android. Looking back now, the Nexus line seems spectacularly messy just in terms of the nature of the phones. It was obvious there wasn't really any year-to-year -year roadmap for the Nexuses. They were more a series of individual showcase devices for Android as a whole rather than a coherent brand. Back then, when I was just starting out covering this stuff, we'd hear of Google accepting submissions from manufacturers for future Nexus devices before a winner would eventually be chosen to develop the phone with the Android team. The attitude towards the Nexus program was split among sources from various companies I've spoken to over the years. Some viewed it as a halo device, a springboard to greater brand notoriety. Others wondered why anyone would pour resources into a phone or tablet that would end up selling poorly and ultimately lose the money in return for not a whole lot besides smartphone nerd kudos. And because Google would be working with a different company's product team every year, the resulting devices were inevitably all over the map in terms of size, design, characteristics and features. For example, between 2013 and 2014, Google went from the relatively pocketable Nexus 5 to the behemoth that was the Nexus 6. One year, LG shared the driving seat with Google, the next, it was Motorola. And this lack of consistency was also present in the phone's capabilities across the board. One year you'd have a good screen, the next year a bad one, camera quality varied wildly from year to year as Google hopped from one Nexus partner to the next, and you had different people with different ideas developing these Nexus phones. Eventually, many Android fans, as well as respected tech press veterans like Walt Mossberg, argued that it was time for Google to make its own handsets, to take ownership of the entire device and just make a real Google phone. Granted, Google had indirectly manufactured phones when it briefly owned Motorola, but the thinking here was that with Google in charge of the entire stack, it would finally be able to put out good, competitive, consistent, pure Android phones year after year. That was the start of what eventually became the Google Pixel. The dawn of 2016 saw rumours that HTC, by then a shadow of its former self but still very much in the game, would be making next-gen Nexuses in two sizes. HTC had made the Nexus 1, which did reasonably well, as well as the ill-fated Nexus 9 tablet, which had been a disaster for the Taiwanese firm, with quality issues and poor sales that only compounded its financial woes. HTC had also submitted a Nexus phone candidate to Google in 2015, but that didn't go anywhere and was eventually adapted into the iPhone 6 lookalike HTC One A9 for release that fall. HTC wasn't Google's first choice to make the 2016 Pixels though. Huawei was reportedly the originally planned ODM, but it was reported that CEO Richard Yu took a dim view of Google's desire to have an entirely self-branded phone. That meant no Huawei logos on the phone or co-branding on the box, a red line for the Chinese firm at a time when it was really trying hard to push into the US market. Interesting side note, Huawei's design for the small Pixel, basically a miniature Nexus 6P, would eventually crop up in late 2016, having been repurposed as the Huawei Nova. Anyway, with Huawei out of the picture, HTC was keen to keep its partnership with Google going, and so what we had was a sprint to the finish line through the rest of 2016, as the folks in Mountain View and New Taipei teamed up on the Google Pixel and Pixel XL. By all accounts, the critical reception to the first Pixels was rather positive. The design was a bit boring, the base 32 gigs of storage was a bit cramped, and it was missing water resistance, which at the time was just starting to become table stakes for high-end phones. In these areas, the Pixel was a step behind the competition, but this was the first proper Google phone. And so reviewers, yours truly included, looked past these gripes and instead found themselves enamoured with the Pixel's phenomenal camera, speedy performance and intelligent new assistant. The Pixel camera was the biggest showcase to date for a technology known as Gcam. Gcam is Google's internal name for HDR+. 
This has been an optional setting on every Nexus phone since the Nexus 5, but the Pixel saw it fine-tuned, supercharged on faster hardware, and most importantly, enabled in every single photo the Pixel took. Google had brought computational photography, photography enhanced by the power of speedy phone processors, to the mass market. Gcam, or HDR+, is a major reason for what success the Pixel line has enjoyed thus far, but it actually started with another Google product which ultimately flopped, Google Glass. The technology that helped Pixel phones take excellent pictures in 2016 started out helping Google Glass's tiny low-quality sensor take acceptable photos back in 2012. In 2016, nobody could touch the Pixel in computational photography. With stunning colors and dynamic range, and excellent nighttime capabilities, the Pixel camera felt at least a couple generations ahead of everything else. The Pixel wasn't just that Google phone, it was that phone with the really great camera. The first Pixel was kind of a transitional product for Google. The switch from Huawei to HTC as manufacturer undoubtedly threw a spanner in the works in terms of timing. HTC engineers were still doing a lot of heavy lifting in the Pixel's code, and we were still only in the very early days of Google's push towards AI as a central focus, which would feature much more prominently in later Pixels. So inevitably there would be a Pixel 2, and HTC once again was on board. Early indications were that there would be up to three Pixel phones released in 2017, two made by HTC and one made by LG, which had collaborated with Google on no less than three Nexus phones back in the day. Ultimately, the long-lost HTC Pixel 2 XL, codenamed Muskie, was canned in favour of the LG-made model. References to it now only exist in code in the Android Open Source project, though I'm sure some physical devices do still exist in a vault somewhere in Mountain View or Taipei. From what I've heard, at least in part, Muskie's cancellation was due to price concerns around the HTC-made model. It's also easy to see how having two larger pixels in any one year would have been confusing to consumers. Muskie was to feature a similar screen size and resolution to the LG Pixel 2 XL, as well as a larger 3830mAh battery. Besides that, not a whole lot is known, and no photos or renders have ever emerged. At the time, it was widely reported that Muskie was being repurposed into the HTC U11+, Plus, but from what I've heard, that's at best an extreme exaggeration, and at worst basically untrue. While there was some engineering crossover at HTC, the U11 Plus is an entirely different device with a different board, different screen, and many different components. Before we get to the actual launch of the Pixel 2 and Pixel 2 XL, a pretty momentous development in late September 2017. Google forked over $1.1 billion to bring aboard some 2,000 HTC engineers, researchers, and designers, many of whom had already been working on the existing Pixel phones. The new Googlers would continue to work out of the HTC HQ building in New Taipei City, but ultimately answer to the Google hardware bosses in Mountain View. From this deal, the floundering HTC got a much-needed cash injection, and for the first time since it briefly owned Motorola, Google had a real, actual smartphone engineering and R&D department, many of whom were already intimately familiar with its phones. This deal wasn't like Google's ill-fated acquisition of Motorola just a few years prior, as new Google hardware boss and ex-Motorola and Rick Ostrello explained at the time. This strategic deal is very different. We know exactly what we need, we want deeper engineering capabilities, and we happen to know this team very well at HTC. This came just as Google was really expanding its hardware division. A few weeks later, alongside the Pixel 2 and 2 XL, Google delivered the Pixel Book, Pixel Buds, and Google Home Mini, among other own branded gadgets. The Pixel 2 phones were generational improvements in some areas, and weird compromises in others. The era of 18x9 smartphones was just beginning, yet the small Pixel 2 had chunky bezels and an old-fashioned 16x9 panel. The LG-made Pixel 2 XL had that more modern-looking tall display with smaller bezels, but that had its own problems in the form of poor colours and viewing angles, crushing of shadow detail, and a tendency towards ghosting or display persistence in some situations. The issues with the screen snowballed into a giant PR nightmare for Google that I surprisingly found myself personally being part of at the time. Despite subsequent fixes to address the colours, the 2XL screen, the thing you're looking at every time you use the phone, was just not good. Critics lauded the Pixel 2 series interface and smart features, like now playing for background song identification, and the new Google Lens feature and the Pixel camera was better than ever with a new optically stabilised shooter. 
But once again, some areas of both phones felt like they were stuck in the past. Weirdly uncompetitive in quite important areas. The Pixel 2's panel was small and boxy, and the 2XL's was a couple generations out of step with what Samsung was putting in its Galaxy S8 series at the time. And this was less excusable because Google was no longer a newbie. It wasn't shipping the rushed Pixel 1 after changing ODMs midstream. These phones had had at least a full year in the oven. Funnily enough though, the substandard screen of the Pixel 2 XL may not have been the original plan for this device. In the months after launch, an apparently well-connected throwaway Reddit account dropped some notes on r slash Android, suggesting the factory that was supposed to build the screens for the Pixel 2 XL and LG V30 wasn't operational in time, so an older generation factory had to be used instead. Take this with a substantial pinch of salt, since I haven't been able to verify it, but it does certainly fit with the facts. Regardless, display quality would go on to become a huge part of the messaging around the launch of 2018's Pixel 3, as Google sought to reassure Pixel fans that it wouldn't be another year of bad screens. By this point, Google had fully integrated its newly acquired XHTC engineers into the Google family, and so everyone was waiting to see how this 100% top-to-bottom Google phone would turn out. Google was also well underway at this point with its transformation into an AI-first company. At the Google I.O. 2018 conference that summer, CEO Sundar Pichai showed off groundbreaking and newsmaking features like Project Duplex. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Great, have a great day, bye. Things like this were the Google difference. This was why a Google phone made sense. Hardware aside, there were some things that only Google could do because of its unique strengths. And when the Pixel 3 series arrived, it had more smart features, more AI, more googly stuff than ever before. Project Duplex launched on the new phones, though limited to the US initially, and in a sort of back-to-front version of Duplex, the Pixel could now screen your incoming calls as well. Meanwhile, the Pixel 3 camera got night sight, a revelation for nighttime photography, and quite possibly the phone's single most impressive new feature. All this high-level software and AI jiggery-pokery made the strongest case yet for a Google phone. Yet, like the previous two years of Pixels, the Pixel 3's weaknesses came from fairly basic mundane hardware flaws that you'd think any mature phone maker would not be falling foul of. Neither phone had exceptionally long battery life, but the smaller Pixel 3 really disappointed in terms of its longevity, and the mere 4 gigs of RAM meant the larger Pixel, with its higher screen resolution, struggled to take photos in quick succession without killing off a lot of apps in the background. Most often this meant that if you were playing music or a podcast while taking photos, your tunes or words would stop dead in their tracks as the Pixel camera gorged itself on memory. Both obvious hardware oversights that a big name in technology should really be avoiding. However, those weren't the only hardware and performance issues affecting the Pixel series. Problems with the original Pixel's microphone eventually resulted in a class action lawsuit which, three years later, bagged OG Pixel owners up to $500 each. Pixel phones had also started to develop a reputation for slowing down considerably with age, especially concerning app load times and camera shutter lag. Now, most computers and phones will succumb to some form of bit rot over years of use, and typically a factory reset is enough to fix things up, but Pixel performance seemed particularly prone to this prickly problem. Artem Rusakovsky, owner of Android Police, documented his Pixel 2 XL woes on Twitter and on his site, prompting Google engineers to offer a home visit to investigate, and even big YouTubers like Marcus Brownlee were calling out Google's phones for their performance degradation. My Pixel 2 has felt like it's slowed down uh, much more than other phones have in the same amount of time I've owned it. The weird part is usually you would expect a phone with stock Android, especially a Pixel or a Nexus or anything from this line, to be A plus optimization because Google controls the experience from the top down, hardware to the software. So this should be the smoothest, fastest Android phone, right? But it's not. Of all the brands for people to be dumping on for poor Android performance, you wouldn't expect it to be the company that makes Android itself, and which you would expect to know how best to optimize it. Worse still, people just weren't buying pixels in large numbers. 
Despite Google pouring countless millions into splashy ad campaigns highlighting genuinely impressive features like Night Sight, the Pixel 3's limited geographical availability, limited carrier partnerships, and high unlock prices meant customers just weren't biting. Google doesn't release Pixel sales numbers publicly, but ZDNet's Ed Bot estimates somewhere between 10 and 12.8 million for the Pixel 3 in its first year on sale. That's not a small number, but it's a fraction of the estimated 40 to 45 million analysts are predicting for the Samsung Galaxy S10 in its first year. To say nothing of the hundreds of millions of iPhones Apple is popping out. Probably the best received Google phone of late has been the budget focused Pixel 3a, which landed in mid 2019. Less powerful than Google's flagships, but with bigger batteries and most of the important features on the Pixel 3, including a near identical camera. But by this time, Android fans were already looking forward to the Pixel 4, hoping to see features that had eluded previous generations of Pixel, like multiple rear cameras and strong all day battery life. A tidal wave of leaks helped prepare the ground for the Pixel 4, with many of its major spec points becoming known ahead of time, thanks in part to official teasers from Google itself. And then in October 2019, the Pixel pattern continued. The Pixel 4 and 4XL brought excellent new Google features like astrophotography mode and the brand new Assistant, and even on-device live transcription supported in every app. Yet with those high-level advancements came weird low-level hardware compromises. The 4th gen Pixels carried over the Pixel 3's battery issues while also lagging behind competitors in terms of charging speeds and storage capacities. Meanwhile, the screens, even with Google's new smooth display, manage neither the fluidity of OnePlus's 90Hz offerings, nor the brightness of Samsung's top-end 60Hz panels. And valuable internal real estate and hardware budget was also taken up with the tech demo Motion Sense feature. Motion Sense is another one of those uniquely Google features, originally developed by ATAP, Google's advanced technology and projects group, and it uses radar to detect gestures at a distance. Motion Sense had been heavily teased before this point, and in the run-up to launch, we were poring over all the Motion Sense demos we'd seen from previous Google presentations. The disappointing reality of Motion Sense is that it makes for a great party trick, but otherwise is mostly useless. It works in a handful of apps, and Google has made vague noises about opening up the API, but nothing concrete has happened yet. This is a hardware decision with huge consequences for the design of the phone, the other hardware which can fit inside it, and perhaps most importantly of all, the countries in which it can be sold, because it's radar after all and there are some weird regulatory requirements. So even if Motion Sense worked perfectly and was seamlessly integrated into all major Android apps, that'd still be one hell of a trade-off. Pixel phones, despite their unique strengths, have always been in some way flawed or imperfect. And those flaws have almost always been obvious and rooted in hardware. The first Pixels? No water resistance and an anemic 32 gigs of base storage. Second gen? Giant bezels on the Pixel 2 and a lousy screen in the 2XL. Pixel 3? Memory management issues that persist to this day, especially on the XL, and crap battery life from the smaller model. Google's counter-argument might be that hardware itself is secondary to the mission of the Pixel brand. The Pixel 3, with its single camera, still managed to take excellent portrait shots, and the Pixel 4, with its mere 2x optical zoom, still produces great computational zoom shots at around 4 to 5x. Now, hardware shouldn't be used as a crutch. You could rightly argue against the vanity specs that dominate some manufacturers' product lineups. Yeah, 12 gigs of RAM is probably silly and unnecessary in 2019, as is cramming in extra camera modules of dubious value just so you can boast of a quad or penta lens array. But there is a difference between avoiding hardware crutchery and thinking you can sidestep a well-rounded spec sheet just because you're Google. Year after year, in my opinion, the Pixel Maker has found itself on the wrong side of that balance. Frankly, the kind of hardware-software balance we see in current Pixel phones is just as much of a crutch. I've spoken on the AC channel before about how Google seems to think the normal rules of Android phone hardware don't apply to it. In essence, it's emulating the attitude of Apple. Don't think too much about what's on the inside, because our phone is greater than the sum of its parts. But when it comes to internal hardware, Google is not Apple. Although it enjoys a close relationship with Qualcomm, which makes the processors for all the Pixel phones, Google itself doesn't manufacture or design the SoCs. 
it also lacks the scale of Apple's iPhone operation and the supply chain benefits that affords it. So when, in 2018, Google puts 4 gigs of RAM into a flagship Android phone, yep, people can't play music and take photos at the same time. And in 2019, when Google sells a phone with a 2800mAh battery, it's no surprise that it has lousy battery life. You might think that Pixel Phone's relatively conservative specs might just come down to money. After all, these things do have to turn a profit. And I could get on board with that were it not for the disproportionate millions Google pours into marketing these things. Google's ads, of course, highlight all the amazing things the latest phones can do. I'm in awe of the astrophotography mode and the other low-light improvements in the Pixel 4 camera, but the irony, as many pundits have pointed out, is that you'd have to be very lucky to have a Pixel 4 make it that late into the night unless you want to have an early evening recharge. And similarly, those battery concerns are a large part of why the Pixel 4 only sparingly ramps up to its full, smooth 90Hz refresh rate, noticeably less often than OnePlus's phones, and why its screen brightness is artificially limited. It ultimately comes down to the question of the icing versus the cake. Google continues to get the icing right, and the Pixel 4, like its predecessors, offers some very tasty icing indeed. Fantastic cameras, pleasing software, impressive voice recognition, and the genuinely useful new assistant. But the cake itself is just a bit half-baked. Whether you look at the low amount of RAM or storage, or the battery life, or the compromises required for motion sense, or the lack of an ultra-wide camera, or the slow wired charging, the foundations just aren't as solid as they should be. And while Google is floundering with the basics, rivals like Apple, Samsung, and Huawei are chipping away at its lead in really important differentiating areas like computational photography. The Pixel series does have more of a clear purpose and direction than the schizophrenic Nexus phones of years past, but I think Google's laser focus on software, service, and AI differentiation has caused it to overlook some of the really important hardware fundamentals. So if selling phones is going to become more than a hobby project for Google, it needs to nail these smartphone fundamentals, the cake and not the icing. Make a great Android phone that your services and AI can live on. And don't try to make an iPhone while you're at it, because if you follow Apple's iPhone recipe with Android ingredients, you'll just end up with a pretty lousy cake. The good news for anyone looking ahead to the Pixel 5 is that at least Google's smartphone hardware woes are pretty plain to see, and, if the will is there, simple enough to solve. That's going to wrap things up. If you like the slightly different style of this video, hit the comments to let us know. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss some great stuff coming up in the weeks and months ahead. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.